So now let's apply our newfound knowledge of how to conduct a hypothesis test for either a variance or standard deviation to this particular problem where all the heavy lifting has been done for us with not one but two computer programs so you can see the difference in the output between them. All right, so having wide disparities from state to state in the number of poor children is a concern for many lawmakers, charity groups, and more. In 2008, the Annie E. Casey Foundation released a study stating that the variability, in other words, the standard deviation, because that's what standard deviation is a measure of, a variability, in the number of children per state in poverty was 350,000. A researcher found the, for the foundation is going to test this value and gathers information on the number of children in poverty in a random group of states from the most recent U.S. Census. The data comes from a population that is normally distributed. Well, thank goodness for that, because if we didn't have normally distributed, we'd be in trouble. The hypothesis test outputs for two computer programs are below. Use these results to answer the questions. All right, now normally I just give you one or the other because they're so similar, but this particular one is very different between these two programs. So I wanted you to see the difference. So stat crunch looks like this, more or less, and then mini tab is a little bit more elaborate and it's harder to read. So there's mini tab. And mini tab, by the way, is also giving us a lot more information. Mini tab gives us these statistics in the middle that stat crunch doesn't bother with. Okay, so what type of test did the researcher perform? Well, you can see right away in either test, you can see it's a right-tailed test because of that greater than in there. So these are right-tailed tests, and I gave it like a purple box there. Now, what parameter is stat crunch testing? So if we look at stat crunch, stat crunch has sigma squared in there. So stat crunch is testing sigma squared. And the null alternative for stat crunch is sigma squared equals 122,500, and sigma squared is greater than 122,500. Minitab, on the other hand, is actually testing sigma. And as typical with Minitab, it actually writes the Greek word out, sigma. So that's a single sigma. Sigma equals 350, sigma greater than 350. So there we have it right there. Those are the null and alternative for the Minitab program. Now, why is that difference no big deal? Well, StatCrunch is using the variance. Minitab uses the standard deviation. But it's OK because 350, when you square it, gives you 122,500. And that's where they came up with the two different numbers. So StatCrunch is using the squared value. Minitab is using the singular sigma value. But they're really doing the same test. All right, now how many states were sampled? Well, Minitab, it's really easy to see. It's right here, n equals 8. But if you had stat crunch, you'd have to go from your degrees of freedom, which is 7, and then add 1 to it, which would get you 8. So I, of course, won't actually give you both programs on an exam, so you'll have to be able to know how to do it each way. So n equals 8 because degrees of freedom is 7, or vice versa. Since n equals 8, then your degrees of freedom is 7. So there you have your two values. Now, the sample standard deviation and the variance, you only can get that actually from um, the standard deviation from here, right here. Standard deviation is 585, and the variance is 341845. Now, if you had stat crunch, you'd have to work at it a little bit to see how they give you sample variance right there. So to find the standard deviation, you'd have to take the square root of 34, what was that number? 34. 1845.4. There you have it. And that's where they get the 585 down here for Minitab. So again, you don't know which program you're going to get, so be careful and make sure you can work with either, pro, pro, either program that you're given. So in this case, StatCrunch would give you this. All right, so we have those two values. Let me just write that one down real quick. There, I added in s is the square root of 341845.4. And I also threw in here, just real quick, the degrees of freedom here is 7. That's why n equals 8. Or vice versa, n equals 8. So, so the degrees of freedom is 7. And that's the actual answer part that we were interested in right there, the degrees of freedom. Now, the variance is given in both programs, so it's kind of whichever one you want. It's an approximation because, of course, different programs will have different decimal places of accuracy, but it's about 341,845. Now, the test statistic and the p-value go hand in hand. 
test statistic right here, T0, there it is, and then the p-value is right there. And then here you can see the test statistic is right there, the chi-square stat and the p-value. Let me give those two a couple labels, one second. There we go, now we can see them all. This is the chi zero squared stat right there. And then this is S squared, your sample variance. And then here I put in S, S squared, and the chi zero squared so you can see them better. All right, so your chi zero squared is your sample statistic, or your test statistic, excuse me. And your p-value, of course, is 0 0.007. All right, so now we're gonna label that on this graph here. So it's a right-tailed test. So let me bring this up real quick. So if you're doing a right-tailed test, then you're doing the p-value method, so one of these three graphs. And since you're doing a right-tailed test, you want the one on the far right. So your chi-0 squared stat is your vertical bar at 19.53. And then the area in that tail is very, very small, but it's 0 0.007. Now before I go any further, let me just talk a little bit more about this two-tailed test business, because it's a little bit strange down here. The thing about the two-tailed test is when you get a stat from your um, computer output, like we have right here, when we have this stat of 19.53, it's a little bit unclear whether it's on the right or the left if you're doing a two-tailed test. The way to figure it out is to look at your degrees of freedom. Seven, right? So let me pull up the table for a second. If you look at the seven degrees of freedom row, just look at that whole row. Remember we put this vertical line in here and the numbers that are on the left over here would be on the left-hand side of that chi-square curve. And the numbers on the right would be on the right-hand side. And so when you look at the number 19 point, sorry, wrong one, 19.53, and then you go back to the table, you can see that in the seven row, or the nine row, excuse me, 19.53 is over here on the right-hand side. It's amongst the bigger numbers, not the smaller numbers. That's how to tell whether or not your, your statistic that they give you, chi-0 squared, is on the left or the right if you're doing a two-tailed test. Of course, a right-tailed test, it's easy, you know it's on the right, or a left-tailed test, it's easy, you know it's on the left. But if it's a two-tailed test, that number they give you, 19.53 in our example, could have been on the left or the right, and that's how you tell. You look at your degrees of freedom in the row, in the table, and figure out if your number for your test statistic is over here on the left-hand side or over here on the right-hand side. This particular one was over on the right-hand side. Of course, we knew that anyway because this one was a right-tailed test. But if it had been a two-tailed test, that's how you would have figured it out. All right, then if the researcher set alpha to be 0.05, would those results be statistically significant? Well, yes, right? Absolutely. And that's because your p-value, which is 0 0.007, is less than our level of significance alpha. So we would reject the null hypothesis, and that means the results are statistically significant. Just one last reminder, when you reject H0, that means to statistically significant. When you do not reject H0, that means not statistically significant. Of course, that's not practical significance. We have no idea whether or not the difference here is a big deal. That's practical significance, like real life, did this have a big effect? But we know statistically it had a big effect. Now, if the researcher set alpha to 0.5, what conclusion would be reached? In other words, perform step six. Okay, so there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the variability in the number of children per state living in poverty is greater than 350,000. Now, realize the real world implica implications of that. This is one which does have big practical significance. Implications. Okay. This would mean that it's very hard for federal organizations that work with poor children to appropriately allocate resources because all the states are so different from each other in terms of the number of children in poverty. You can imagine, for example, that California would have a lot of people in poverty simply because it has a lot of people. Right? Whereas a state like Montana, even if it has a good percentage of people in poverty, it just doesn't have a huge population. So that can make it very difficult. So um, this, these results are both statistically significant and practically significant. I can't say the word significant, but there it is. So both statistically significant and practically significant because they have, um, because we rejected H naught. Oh, here, let me, let me add that in there. 
statistically significant because we rejected H naught, practically significant because it has big implications for the real world, quote unquote. All right, we're done with section 10.4. I'll see you back here for 10.5 for a quick recap of everything we've learned so far in chapter.